Hi, this is my 127th video on actuarial exam FM problem solving. In this video, we're taking a look at problem 5.1.5 in this new 7th edition of Samuel Roverman's Mathematics of Investment and Credit that's just come out here in May 2018, and I used it in the last video. Uh, this problem is can be found in both the 7th edition and this older 6th edition. However, there's something about the 6th edition that's actually superior here. There was a mistake made in the 7th edition. Um, this problem really belongs in section 5.3 of the 7th edition because in the um, exposition of the content, the reading, in the, from the 6th edition to the 7th edition, the content here, the abbreviations that you see here, uh, some of them at least were moved from section 5.1 to section 5.3 in the 7th edition. So in reality, one thing to point out here is if you have a professor, a teacher, who is assigning this problem, they really should assign it after um, you've started section 5.3 if you are using the 7th edition. Another thing to say about this problem is it's actually not something that's technically on the actuarial exam FM syllabus here in 2018. Uh, you should know the concept of IRR and NPV, internal rate of return and net present value, but some of these other new concepts with these new abbreviations are technically not on the syllabus now. They could be on a future syllabus, perhaps, but I think it's still worth going over. For one thing, these are good things to know just in general for corporate finance. For another thing, it's going to solidify some of the ideas that we've talked about recently with the IRR and the NPV and the idea of the interest preference rate or cost of capital. It'll be a good thing to review that with another video here. So here is the problem. Essentially, this problem is about uh, a corporate investment, say, in some capital. You might pretend some equipment, that kind of thing, and you're getting some returns, maybe increased profits, and you're wondering, is this a worthwhile investment to make? So it's a corporate finance kind of thing, and these are different ways of deciding um, between two investments. For perhaps you could maybe have alternative invest investments in capital that you're thinking about. So it's a planning kind of thing. You've got a project that requires an initial cap capacity outlay, uh, an investment of 30000 which I will, by the way, write as 30. Um, all the amounts are going to be in thousands to keep things shorter. And it's going to return the following amounts paid at the ends of the next five years, 14000 12000 6000 4000 2000 And we're going to solve for various things. Let me, before we highlight what those various things are, let's go ahead and draw our number line. Get that done right away. You've got time zero with the initial investment. One, two, three four and five. The amounts are going to be in thousands. Amounts are in thousands. And thinking about net outlays, the 30,000 is money going out of your hand right away. I'll write that as negative 30. Then at time one you've got a return, a positive quantity of 14,000. I'll write that as a 14. Then a 12,000 which I'll write as a 12, etc. Six, four, and two. So that's the setup. Now we want to solve for various things. Part A is our old firm, the internal rate of return, IRR. Part B is something called the modified internal rate of return. That's the MIRR, assuming a certain cost of capital, a certain interest preference rate. Part C, the net present value, NPV which is also based on the given cost of capital. Next, something new called the payback period, PBP. Uh, this first part is not taking time value of money into account, but the discounted payback period does, which is, means it's more important, really. Discounted payback period, assuming a certain cost of capital. And then one more new thing, the profitability index, you could call that PI, and that is also based on the cost of capital. That's also assuming that certain cost of capital, even though it doesn't say it there. All right, so these various things to compute. We'll do the IRR first, part A, and that's just going to be with a calculator. Okay, so turn it on, go to your cash flow spreadsheet. Enter the amount at time zero, which is negative 30. Make sure you enter it so you see an equal sign. 
tab down, the next amount is 14, time one, enter that. The next number that's going to show up as I tab down is going to be a frequency, which we always leave at one. Then I tab down again, I see a CO2, that's the 12 at time two, enter that. Tab down a couple times to put a six in here. Tab down a couple times to put a four next. And one more tab down a couple times to put a two in the last spot at time five. Now we press IRR and CPT for compute. And we get a internal rate of return, a yield rate of 12.026%. So the IRR is approximately 12.026%. It gives you it as a percent, which as a decimal without a percent sign would be 0 0.12026. Okay, so that's the first part. Now we're on to part B. Calculate the MIRR. I'll call it J for short, as the textbook does. What is the MIRR? Well, again, it's based on a certain cost of capital a certain interest preference rate, and I've said in previous videos what that it can represent is in your mind um, a planning kind of thing. You might think, okay, I know in a few years, maybe starting next year, I think that there will be certain investments, maybe in bonds, that will return 10% per year. Um, and so in, it, instead of, well, what I could do is I could reinvest these amounts that I get, the 14, 12, 6, 4, and 2, at that cost of capital and get a certain return of 10%, it can accumulate to a certain amount in the future at time five, say, um, which, you know, if, if the internal rate of return is bigger than that, that's actually a worse investment. Ideally, we'd like to in invest at the internal rate of return to actually get that as our actual yield rate here upon reinvestment. However, maybe it's not gonna be possible. So we wanna think about the cost of capital Think about the future value of these returns at that time and compare it with what the future value of the initial investment would be at some other rate of return. What's an equivalent rate of return for that initial investment over five years? What rate of return will, will give us the same future value as these inflows do at that, time, at that moment in time, time five, based on a cost of capital of 10%. Now that may have been confusing, but the details are not too bad. Uh, so again, we take the um, cost of capital to be 10%, I'll call that I as the textbook does. And what we wanna really compute here then, first of all, the future value of these inflows at time five is going to be 14 times 1.1 to the fourth power, because it's gotta go forward in time by four years, plus 12 times 1.1 to the third power, plus six times 1.1 squared, plus four times 1.1 plus two. That's gonna be the future value of these inflows to you at time five based on a, an assumed cost of capital of 10%. And the question really is, what should J be so that 30 would accumulate to the same thing? under compound interest over five years. You wanna solve this equation for J. Okay, that's what it's all about. So that was a kind of a long description of a fairly simple idea actually. And now it's just a matter of doing the computations. Unfortunately, these coefficients are not the same, so I can't use formulas for you um, know level annuities. Instead, I need to just use the calculator and probably use some of the, um, the memory of the calculator here. So let's see, let's go 1.1 to the fourth times 14, and let's store that in register one. Then take 1.1 to the third times 12 and store that in register two. Take 1.1 squared times six and store that in register three. 1.1 times four is going to be 4.4 plus two, okay, now I can do the other ones, plus what's in register one, plus what's in register two, plus what's in register three. And what I get is this, I get 50.1294, 50.1294 equals this. Now I wanna just solve for J. I can do that in my head here with calculator help. 
I won't bother writing stuff down. I got to divide both sides by 30. So divide this by 30. And that would be what 1 plus j to the fifth power would be. Raise both sides to the 1 fifth power, to the 0.2 power. That's 1 plus j. Subtract 1 from that. j is approximately 0.10814. 10.814 percent. Okay, now the fact that that's bigger than 10 percent is telling you if you get this kind of return, if you get these returns, these amounts over the next five years in this way, you are going to get better than you would get uh, if you took these amounts and reinvested at 10 percent. Okay, so that's good. This seems like a good investment because of that perspective. Next, on to part C. Net present value based on a cost of capital 10% per year. Based on what we've talked about, that's going to be the present value of, all the, of the entire cash flow, including the negative 30 at the beginning, at time 0. So we're going to discount these back to time 0. The negative 30 is already at time 0, so I'm going to have negative 30 plus 14v plus 12v squared plus 6v cubed plus 4v to the fourth plus 2v to the fifth where v is 1 over 1 plus i where i is assumed to be the cost of capital so this is 1 over 1.1 which turns out to be 0 0.90 repeating and now it's just a matter of doing this calculation Let's store V in register 0. Let's skip the minus 30 for the moment. So we'll take that times 14, store that in register 1. Then take V and square it times 12, store that in register 2. Then take V cubed times 6, store that in register 3. Take v to the fourth times four, store that in register four. Then take finally v to the fifth times two. Not going to bother storing that. Now add what's in register four and what's in register three and what's in register two and what's in register one. And finally subtract 30. So the answer in thousands is 1.126. And in if you convert it back to ordinary dollar amounts, say that would be 1126. Okay, that would be the net present value of this based out that, on that cost of capital of 10%. Positive. So that's that's good. So one other thing that emphasizes that this seems like a good investment. Maybe not compared to some other investment, but um, at least this is positive. All right, on to the payback period. What is the payback period? The payback period is something where you're thinking about getting your money back without thinking about um, interest, without thinking about the time value of money. So it's not really the most ideal thing. It's just sort of a psychological thing, perhaps. How long do you have to go? It is a payback period until you first get back more than what you invested, not thinking about interest at all. So we can just look at this timeline and just do calculations in our head to figure out the payback period. So 14 plus 12 is 28, or 26, excuse me. So we haven't quite got our 30 back yet. Plus another 6 is up to 32. There we are, higher than the original 30. Therefore, the payback period is 3. <clears throat> it's going to take 3 years. years until we get to a return amount that is higher than our initial investment in nominal dollars without taking the time value of money into account. Again, 14 plus 12 is 26. 26 plus 6 is 32. 32 is 30, bigger than 30. That's the first time when we get um, a nominal dollar amount total that is more than our original investment. So the payback period is three years. More important, though, is the modified discounted payback period, I should say, where we do take the time value of money into account according to the cost of capital, the 10% again. Okay, so now the question is, what's the first moment in time when our discounted, when our present value of our returns 
is higher than what we invested. So there you're really thinking about the this part of the net present value equation and continuing to add these terms until you get above 30. And it's actually going to be in the very last one when you finally get above 30, if you want to verify that here based on what I've already put in the calculator. There's the present value of, of 14. Add what's in register 2. Add what's in register 3. We are still not above 30. Add what's in register 4. We are still not above 30. Almost. You could almost say the discounted payback period is 4, but not quite technically where this discounted payback period is supposed to be a whole number. So it's really going to be 5 years to be technically above 30. Um, that's based on the definition and the reading of the text. Actually, if you look at some of the answers in the back of the book or in the answer key, and sometimes they'll hedge their bets and say, well, uh, it's just bigger than four years. Okay, and, and yeah, after four years, we got 29.88. It was almost 30. So effectively, you might say it's four years. You might say just bigger than four years, but technically, by their definition in the book, it's five years. I'll just put or slightly bigger than four years. if you allow non-whole number answers and non-precise answers, if you allow non-whole number answers. Effectively, it's four years. It was so close. From a practical point of view, it's effectively four years. All right, finally, we are to this thing called the profitability index. Um, and that's something new as well. Another way to measure whether a return, whether an investment seems worthwhile or not. PI, or maybe just I for short, that's the way it's written in the book. This is for a general cash flow. It's the present value of the inflows divided by the present value of the outflows at the given cost of capital interest preference rate, though oftentimes the outflow is just one number at time zero, and so its present value is it, the actual investment amount. So the PV of the outflows is same as the initial investment if there is just one outflow. Okay, and we've really already done the work for this. Uh, the present value of the inflows is what I've circled here. Since when we subtracted that, we got 1.126. When we add 30 back on, we're going to get what I've circled here in blue. We're going to get 31.126. That would be the present value of the inflows in thousands. Present values of the outflows is the 30, again, at time zero. So this ratio is going to give us our profitability index, 31.126 divided by 30, 1.03753. And the important point about this is that it is bigger than a 1. Okay, you are shooting for profitability indices that are bigger than 1. That's telling you whether it's worthwhile or not. These are different ways about thinking about your investment and whether it's worthwhile compared to maybe another investment in capital. And so uh, I think it's a good problem to go over and talk about, even though it's technically not on actuarial exam two here in 2018.